Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 51, I'm going to show you how to set the bias on your push-pull Class AB amp. And we also have a new set of tubes for the Wilsonton R8 to take a look at. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Recently I sold a nice quad of vintage EL34s to a customer, and I realized some people need a bit of instruction on how to set the bias on a push-pull amp. We're going to use the Wilsonton R8 for this demonstration, but the procedure is going to be the same for most amps, with either a built-in meter, like the R8, or with test ports in which you have to hook up your voltmeter. Okay, let's get this going. Now, I like to put my preamp tubes in, and with some amps you have to get your bias switch in the right position. Now, in the case of the Wilsonton R8, it's got a EL34 family switch, which is up, or the KT88 family, which is down. So, um, in this case, uh, we're going to do the um, RFT power tubes, which are EL34s, uh, so they're up. The switch is up. I'm not going to lift the amp and turn it around for you. The thing weighs almost 50 pounds, so <laughs> it wouldn't be very easy on camera. Because uh, I roll a lot of tubes, I use socket saver lifters, and um, the um, the procedure is to gently rock and push straight in. Now, these socket savers are actually uh, have been really popular in the store, but they come a little snug, so they need to be loosened up. And actually, while I'm doing this, let's we're going to do a bunch of things, including looking at um, microphonics. Let's just talk about loosening up socket savers while we're at it, because it's going to be a quick video. So normally, I ship them like this, all linked up and wrapped, of course, carefully in, in foam and plastic. So they're going to be stiff. So go ahead and loosen off the first one on the top and put it into the bottom. And then do it all over again, right? You're getting the idea. Keep doing that and loosen up the sockets. Now, if you've got older fingers, my father has very old fingers. You have to give up golfing, unfortunately. Uh, he has no grip left. Get somebody younger to give you a hand and loosen them up for you. I actually had a customer complain that he couldn't couldn't use the sockets and uh, ended up sending them back. He had to send the tubes back as well because he he got he got rid of the amp. Unfortunately, it just wasn't working for him. Okay, um, but the sockets, stiff sockets, and old fingers just don't go well together. So. Uh, first tube in was a GE 6SN7GTB. Uh, next we got a Jan Sylvania 6SL7. Now these, the, the Jans are not actually, they're a premium 6SL7. They're not part of the German uh, gold package. The standard Sylvania 6SL7 is. Frankly, there's not a lot of difference between them. There might be a better heater spec on the Jan tubes. I'm not certain. The reason I'm using them is because they're slightly microphonic, and we want to talk about microphonics in a minute. We're going to do a whole bunch of things, so hold tight. In the center slot, V5, I like to use uh, the Rock Solid uh, Russian Photon. I actually put some premium, when I first got the amps, I, I started trying some premium vintage tubes in the slot, and some of them got crackly and noisy. They just did not like the circuit, and that's the thing. It can happen, um, even to the best of tubes. But this Russian tube is dead quiet. So next we've got another of these uh, Jan 6SL7s. These 1950 Sylvanias, by the way, they're some of the best sounding 6SL7s ever made. And last of the preamp tubes is another one of the GE uh, 6SN7 GTBs. Okay, now, before you think about plugging your power tubes in, turn down the bias. Now the reason why we're doing this is because we don't want a red plate, we don't want to over bias the tube by accident and red plate it. Now 
I don't know if I have to describe what red plating is. Basically, the plate of the power tube turns orangey red. And of course, anyone here who knows anything about physics knows that the color can tell us the heat. And red is a bad, a bad color to be seeing on a plate that's normally gray. <laughs> so don't do that. So what we do is there's four tubes in this push-pull amp. And we turn, so counterclockwise, we turn all the biases to zero. We don't fool around, we get them all down. Now, because I only have 25 minutes to shoot the video, I've only turned down V1 and 2, and I've left um, V3 and 4 alone at their proper setting. Now, in a quad uh, push-pull amp, the two tubes on the right are working together, right, to, to drive the right-hand channel, and the two on the left, are working together. So there's really no issue in having the bias wrong on one side. Well, it's not on at all. Actually, the tubes are turned off completely when the bias is turned down like this. Let's make sure they're all seated. I'm talking, and in an earlier shoot, I actually got the seat of one of the tubes wrong and the heater didn't come on. Okay, let's turn it on. Now, while it's, it takes a little while, it has a, it just has a timer because it takes a little bit to warm up tubes. Everybody knows that. And until then, let's get the, the volume should be down to zero. But I was, you know, in an early shoot, I was I was showing some microphonics. Now to test microphonics, we're letting everything warm up here. To test microphonics, we don't want to be hammering away with a pen or a pencil. There's too much mass. It's too long a lever. Not even this little bias screwdriver. That's too bloody big and heavy. What we want is something very, very, and your finger is, is too, too, too big and dangerous. <laughs> um, think about the things we used to do with our fingers when we were kids. So you don't want to be flicking your finger at a tube. What you want is something like a little stylus brush like this. It weighs a couple of grams at the most, and it's got a very short lever arm. So it's a perfect thing for tapping for, for um, microphonics. And we'll do that in a minute. We're warmed up. Now... If we check V1, I hope you can see the meter here, there's nothing coming on the bias meter at all. It's just jumping slightly. So let's get in there with our little screwdriver. Don't go blindly poking screwdrivers around two amps. They have high voltages. We talked about that at the beginning. This is make sure you're in the right spot where the bloody screw goes, right? They're labeled. So bring, you know, click your your little lever over to V1, a little switch, and bring it up slowly. So this is a counter, this is a clockwise turn on the screw. And we just bring it up slowly and we're gonna center it right dead nuts in the middle. And we're not gonna fuss. And the reason we're not gonna fuss is that 20 minutes from now we're gonna come back and do a little micro adjustment. The tubes will settle in, especially a new set, they're gonna settle in over a few days and um, they're going to need a little bit of an adjustment. Let's see if I can get the screwdriver. Normally I jump up here and block the camera view and get the and, and do this from on top so that I can see where the slot is for the adjustment screw. But um, here I'm, I'm doing it blind. There we go. Okay, we're on. So we're on V2 here. Pushing the switch over to V2. Now some amps just have a little plug-in for a voltmeter. Most likely you set it up into millivolts and your manual will tell you what the spec you're what you're going to be biasing to and the screws and the plugs are normally in the rear. Follow your manual's instructions but if the manual doesn't tell you to, to zero out your bias bring your bias down. Make sure you know which way to turn the screw to zero your bias out because the, the 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 bias pots could have been wired in backwards, so be careful with that. Okay, so, and let's just take a look at V3 and V4. And they were set earlier before the shoot, and they're perfect. Now, when you're first putting a new set of power tubes into an amp, keep an eye on them. Don't walk away from them. If they get into trouble and they start doing something, making a lot of noise or red plating, shut the amp off right away and figure out what's wrong before you destroy something. 
Red plating can not only destroy the power tube, but it actually can start burning out components in the amp. And we don't want that. We want to avoid it. So a little bit of vigilance is fine. You can keep an eye on things. You'll be good. So now if we had, um, let's just pretend we, we'd been listening to music for happily for 20 minutes. The tubes are looking fine. Their color is good. The amp is sounding great. Turn off the music, come back up, and do a little micro adjustment. There's no set time on this. If you start twitching at 15 minutes like I usually do, come on up and do your micro adjustment. Half an hour, an hour, it doesn't matter. All we want to do is get it back and look, it's down just a hair. I'm just going to center it. Now with a new set of tubes to your amp, every, every day just warm up the tubes when you're sitting down for a listening session. Check the bias quickly on the first tube. You don't have to check them all, but you can if you want. If the first tube is dead nuts on, most likely the rest of them are just going to be fine. And then you'll periodically check them at longer and longer periods of time. It's normal for the bias to, over a long period of time, to slowly weaken and you have to turn it up a little bit. Makes sense, right? And to get all four tubes back performing on spec. But it's not normal for the bias to shift around constantly. That is not normal, and that means you've got a problem. And I see that most often with crap power tubes, frankly, um, from countries that start with the letter C. <laughs> a country, a big country. Um, and, you know, it's a thing. I mean, the, 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 they're, Back in the 1950s, uh, G was making uh, a 6SN7, a taller bottle version of this, and they were terrible tubes. They sounded pretty good, but they weren't reliable 6SN7s. Um, I've tested hundreds of them, and many of them are dead on arrival, DOA. Many of them die in the tester. Uh, many of them are mismatched dramatically. And then they came out with the GTA short bottle, which is very much like the GTB. And they're wonderful tubes. They're a solid, 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 reliable tube. So I have a feeling um, management at GE told the engineers, we've got a bad, we're getting a terrible name for tubes because 6SN7s are, are, were one of the most common tubes used um, back in the day. And even today are very common. They're, they're, um, they're in amps all over the place. And uh, I use them constantly in, in both commercial amps and in my custom builds. So to get a bad name on a tube that everybody is buying would be a terrible thing. Anyways, they really got it right with the GTA and GTB. Those are rock solid tubes and they, they really perform well in cathode follower stages and in um, drive, drive, the drive stage, phase inverter stage. Okay, let's, let's do a little bit of microphonics testing. Now, the thing about tubes is they're all microphonic. Some are low, some are medium or moderate, and some are high, and some are just crazy off-the-scale microphonic. The off-the-scale stuff is garbage. If you plug in a set of tubes and they're well seated and your speakers start ringing, the tubes start ringing, and your speakers pick it up, of course, those are garbage tubes. In the garbage they go. I don't throw them out, tubes out that often that ring like that, but it does happen. Now, if you want to know how microphonic your tube is, get your volume up to a normal listening level. Not maximum. Absolutely not maximum. You don't want to be doing tests with your amp ever at maximum, or you, you endanger blowing up your tweeters and your other drivers. So, so just bring it up to a very modest listening level. And with something very light and short like this, just give it a gentle tap. We're not hammering. We're just doing a little tap. No sound at all. Maybe, maybe a tiny little bit. Now these tubes are a little bit more microphonic. Can you hear that? Just a little tiny tap. There, you see? Can you hear that? I'm going to shut up. There you go. Now, does that mean that that's a dead tube? No. That Actually, these are high gain tubes. They have a mu or gain of 70, which is way up there. The one of the higher gain tubes, the 12AX7, has a gain of 100. A more common tube like the 6SN7 has a gain of 20 or a mu of 20. Now, noise floor and microphonics are directly related to the gain of the tube. 
So a lower gain tube at 20 is going to have lower noise floor automatically and automatically it'll have a lower mic level of microphonics. Now that's going to differ, for, differ from tube manufacturer to tube manufacturer and tube type to tube type. But that's sort of your general baseline. And the ratio is strictly on the gain. So if we had, let's just pretend that this was um, 60 instead of 70. It's easier. The math is easier. It has a gain three times what the 6SN7 has. Now that doesn't mean that the tube is potentially biased that way. It probably isn't. But it is certainly going to be biased a lot hotter than the 6SN7. It might be sitting at a gain of 50. But just as a baseline, it has three times, let's say, the gain. It's going to have three times the noise floor, and it's going to have three times the microphonics. It's just a given. Now, now uh, that we understand that the baseline has is low, is high, now we go to the actual tube type. You know, who made the tube, what years they were made, and these wonderful sounding uh, Sylvania 6SL7s from the 1950s, they're normally, I would say, a little, well, let's say they're close to moderately microphonic. Does that mean that they're bad tubes? No. In fact, many of the Muller um, small signal tubes like the 12AX7 and 12AU7 are fairly microphonic and they ring quite well. When a tube is a problem with microphonics is when it's when it's in idle, there's no signal applied, and the speakers are ringing. That is a big problem. If you tap on the case, and it rings a little tiny bit, that's not a problem. You're not going to be tapping along to the music, or at least you shouldn't be. You should be sitting back so you're in the sweet spot. And obviously, a sound wave, even at loud volume, is not going to be hammering on the tube at this, with this amount of force, is it? No, it's not. So, relax. It's nice to know how microphonic your tubes are. You can check your power tubes, and sometimes power tubes will ring. And sometimes they'll ring so badly that I garbage them. There, hear that? A little bit. I'm going to turn it up. Don't do this at home. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. Hear that? So it's got a little bit of a ring. Let's turn that down. Let's let's turn this off. That's perfectly normal and it's perfectly acceptable. When a power tube is a problem is if you tap it and the ringing is, is ridiculously loud, you can hear it, it just goes, everything goes crazy. You'll, when you have a microphonic tube that's a problem tube, you'll know. Otherwise, just relax and don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Okay. Um, now, what you're seeing here, other than the 6SL7s, um, these are Jans, um, and the normal... Uh, German uh, gold package is going to have the regular uh, Sylvania 6SL7. They're going to range, it'll be, it'll depend on what nice tubes I have from the 50s to the 70s. They're a little bit different, but they're basically the same tube. They have, they, they all sound, they have the same lovely uh, Sylvania sound signature, warm and rich with a nice amount of detail. And the only reason why I brought these in is because they, they do ring a little bit and I wanted to let you hear that. I hope you picked it up on camera anyways. Um, but any set of tubes for an amp like the R8 that's got nine tubes, it's always anchored with the power tubes. Everything matters, but the power tubes anchor it. And the, um, the, the RFTs from East Germany, these are uh, vintage NOS new in the new new old NOS NOS new old stock NIB new in the box. It's getting harder and harder to find good quality vintage power tubes that are matched that are brand new. Anyways, they're brand new. RFT made a lovely EL34, and the distinguishing feature of the um, of these tubes is the clarity. They have a lot of great detail. Now, I did a whole tube lab on the RFT uh, a few episodes ago, so if you're interested in the review, go, go on back. But anyways, this is basically the, the, uh, the new set for the R8, the 
the German gold set. Okay, and at this point I usually talk about what tubes came in and some beautiful new in the box, new old stock, um, 6SL7s came in. Sylvanias, we were just talking about Sylvanias, so why not have a look at some more? I never get tired of looking at uh, tubes that are packed on September 1959. <laughs> uh, let's just open it. Look at the shape of the box. It's just amazing. If you know, if I wasn't familiar with what these boxes look like, I would think, wow, is that a fake box? But no, this is the real McCoy. You can actually see the smudge of the stamp when they, when they inked it. So this is a brown base. Brown bases are mil-spec. And these 6SL7s um, are, are just wonderful 6SL7s. They're very low noise. They were made um, probably for uh, high-speed aircraft. You know, that's going to have to suffer some G's. They're, it's a short, very rigid structure. What else came in? Well, we're going to have a theme. We're going to do Sylvania 6SL7s on the show. So, Jan 75, so quite a bit later. Same kind of box, though, eh? They didn't, the boxes didn't, let me grab the other one. Look at the difference. The boxes really didn't change that much. This is prettier, I think. But, you know, there's still generic boxes. They, these were not meant for consumer use. Nobody ever expected that I would get my hands on them and that you would buy them from me. <laughs> these were meant to go into aircraft, into tanks, um, so now we've got a black base, very much the same tube structure. Can you see it? Now, the getters changed. In this case, um, it's sort of a square um, horseshoe-like getter, and here is a large round halo getter. But the plates are very much the same. Now, if I was matching these tubes, I would put brown base to brown base, correct halo. There's gray plate version. I put black plate to black plate. You get the picture, and I put the black bases together as well. They probably, the plates look very, very much the same. They probably are the same basic plate, uh, even though they were made um, 16 years apart. So look at this. Now this is a consumer box. Colorful. It's got the Sylvania shield with the lightning bolts. I love lightning bolts. I would almost buy a tube just to get a nice box like that. But inside is a more modern Sylvania 6SL7. All these 6SL7s, um, you know, the, the, the Jan with the waist chrome from the 1950s, 40s and 50s, um, are wonderful sounding. The shorter plate, it's a different sound, but a wonderful sounding tube nonetheless. Very low noise. And here's the, the, the last version of that tube. It's got a really large chrome dome. Plates are very similar to the 1940s and 50s version. And the sound signature is sound signatures, very, very similar. Another wonderful sounding tube. This is probably uh, made in the late 60s into the 70s. We don't always have date codes on. The nice thing about mil spec boxes is we get we, we'll get a, at least a, a packed on date, and that essentially gives us a manufacturing date or something very close to the date of manufacture. Okay, well, hopefully that was informative. If you stayed all the way to the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got um, I've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.